my name is Denise. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. Um, I'm by no means a seasoned presenter or talker, so this is a little bit out of my comfort zone. <laughs> um, some ha yes, thank you. <laughs> Showing up, number one. <laughs> um, so, some housekeeping rules. Toilets left. A lady called Tony shouts and runs. There's no trial fire alarms. Leave the building. <laughs> Good to go out the way you came in. <laughs> um, and we'll go from there. So my name is Denise. Uh, I've been working here at the Ralph for two years as an anaesthesia nurse. Um, I qualified as a nurse in 2014 in Ireland and moved here because I loved anaesthesia. And it wasn't quite the same in Ireland. It wasn't at the same level. So I wanted to kind of go as far as I could be at the right hand of anaesthetist um, and I carried out my BTS throughout kind of 2018, 2019 and passed the exam in September 2021 post the pandemic and yeah I just love anaesthesia so I was going to take you guys through some common questions that we get when nurses come and you know work with us when they shadow me um, and things that along the journey that I've learned and they just kind of blew my mind how kind of seemingly simple it seemed um, but it added so much depth to what I was doing every day um, and with the ultimate goal of just looking after the animals we have to the best of our ability which I know that we all love to do um, so I was going to keep it quite casual a little bit of chat of what we probably all do in our everyday life, add a little bit of physiology, a bit of depth, and take any questions that you guys have, feel free to raise your hands. If I don't see you, make a noise. Um, but yeah, we can do it a little bit informal. Um, so, one of the most kind of frequent things I do initially when I learnt myself and also when I work with um, nurses that are coming in to referral anaesthesia is how can I safely perform IPPV. It was always something that when I was training um, that I realise now I didn't really have a grasp of the physiology behind it, of the depth of what I was doing when I held an APL valve and squeezed a bag. So from my point of view and kind of working with animals we all perform IPPV every day. So to perform manual IPPV safely um, so there's both manual and mechanical, but the manual is holding the APL, APL valve and us manually squeezing the bag. Need to know is the tidal volume of the patient. This is an estimation based on our knowledge of lung volumes, the weight of the patient and formulas that we know for calculating tidal volume. Um, what frequency or respiratory rate we're going to provide. And I think an uh, important aspect is the ratio of inspiration to expiration. Um, I've seen a few times when people are trying to, particularly when you're doing a CT and you want apnea for a thorax, uh, for a thorax CT, sorry, C commonly people provide IPPV really rapidly because you want to hyperventilate the patient and you want to drop the carbon dioxide of these patients so they're not inclined to breathe, so their respiratory drive is driven down. Um, but I think it, there's a safe way to do this and we do it kind of, I prefer to do it slowly over time instead of providing very quick, very fast breaths in a really abnormal kind of physiology or providing like a very abnormal physiology for these patients. So I'll take you through a little bit um, what we're doing when we calculate tidal volume, frequency, how we manage our ratio of inspiration to expiration. And additionally, you can add on things such as peak inspiratory pressure and use of a pressure manometer. So my little BP isn't working, sorry. So these are um, pressure manometers and you can see ours is, this is ours from CT and it's attached to the inspiratory limb of our breathing circuit. And when we provide IPPV manually, we can assess what's called the peak inspiratory pressure of the patients. And we try and use this to assess the, it's almost an indirect measurement of the tidal volume that we're providing to these patients. So I kind of, I learn visually, so I'll take you guys through it on a whiteboard and show you kind of how I learned it when I learned it. So usually when we're working with a tidal volume with our patients, so this is usually the um, way a tidal volume is written. 
twist it around. Sorry if everyone can't see. So for our patients, a uh, common tile volume is between 10 and 20 mil per kilo. So anywhere between these values, we should be providing a safe tidal volume for patients that do not have any severe respiratory physiology or pathophysiology. At that point, we probably need to reconsider kind of what tidal volumes we're using and what pressures we're using. What I commonly do, we tend to work between eight and 12 mil per kilo. That gives us a very safe range. So we're not providing too high. This is kind of the upper end, slightly lower end for dogs and cats much prefer these lower um, tidal volumes. They've got small chests, they've got very compliant chests and they tend to be um, over inflated very easily. Um, what I would then do is have a roundabout in my head very quickly, 10 mil per kilo. So I have let's say a 10 kilo dog and I've chosen a 500 mil bag. With this patient, you can see straight away that the tidal volume for this patient is approximately 100 mils. So when we're squeezing those bags, we want to be giving approximately a fifth of that bag. So I tend to not fully close an APL valve. I leave it semi-open and allow some of it to go out into the scavenging. And I give the bag a squeeze. And as much as I possibly can, I visualize the chest of the patient to see a natural excursion. I would say with cats, classically, you don't see very big excursions when they breathe, right? They're in, they're kind of inside their kennels and you're monitoring them and their chest is very moving very minimally. What I see when I even give what I suspect to be a 10 mil or approximately, I'm going up to maybe trying to aim for eight here on the pressure manometer. I see quite a big excursion already. It's quite abnormal already what we're providing them. So definitely these small little breaths are ideal for cats. And then most of the times if I have, say, a student nurse or a nurse new to anesthesia stepping up and about to give IPVV, I would like them to have an idea in their head of the tidal volume they're about to use and the bag that they're using as well. So potentially your rebreathing or um, rebreathing a reservoir bag doesn't actually need to be that big. Usually our bags are 40 mil per kilo. So this is a max size really for a rebreathing or um, reservoir bag and you can see this is twice the max tidal volume that we would use for patients. So we don't actually, when I started doing this calculation I realized I was just grabbing like three litre bags for 20 kilo Labradors and they don't need it, their lungs are not that big and that means that when we provide IPPV we're probably more likely to provide safer volumes and safer pressures using smaller bags, it's just mass because we'll squeeze the bag and we'll have an estimate on our head. But these are really useful um, pieces of equipment to have. Uh, and to be honest, they are very affordable. So I would, I would recommend anywhere that we commonly provide IPPV, we have these um, and a few of them knocking around that if we're deciding to provide IPPV on a patient that we don't have a ventilator, we add one of these to the circuit. So apart from tidal volume, then we have um, this kind of PIP that I said, which is peak inspiratory pressure. So if you have your kind of very shabby drawing of lungs, as we breathe in, there's a pressure that we sense. If we inhale, 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 we feel that discomfort. So what we're trying to do is avoid causing them that discomfort. And remaining within pressures that are safe for the lungs to take. So we're avoiding volume trauma and we're avoiding, avoiding barotrauma. Um, PIPs usually, that we call them, are somewhere between less than 20 centimetres of H2O. They're measured in 20 centimetres of H2O and you'll see here that there's a green bubble on 20 centimetres of H2O so they don't want us going any further. Unless there's a clinical reason, unless there's some sort of respiratory, again, pathophysiology that we're trying to overcome, in some cases, we may have to go into the slightly more orange um, area to provide a given volume for these patients. So as we provide, so classically for cats, I provide maybe eight to 10. Again, they're smaller, more delicate. And for dogs, anywhere from 10 to 15. I, f I find I'm using on these systems to try. If I'm trying to um, 
induce apnea. Higher pressures generally over, like, overventilate, then hyperventilate the patient, drop the CO2, and drop the respiratory drive quicker. So you tend to do slightly kind of higher pressures than you would maybe if you're ventilating them for three hours in a surgery. So these are kind of very useful. Um, the other thing to keep in mind, sorry, if there's any details that you want afterwards, just let me know, is one of the key kind of words that I learned during IPPV was this word. What does this mean? And what are we doing when we cause this positive pressure? So breathing, normally, spontaneous breathing in patients is negative. They work on negative pressures. We do as well. So as we're kind of breathing, we get a message from our brain to come down and tell the intercostal muscles to contract and the diaphragm to contract. So it goes with a, a law, but as volume increases, pressure decreases. So as we pull out our lungs, which we do as we inhale, our volume increases and our pressure decreases. It decreases by something very small, millimeters, like minus one millimeters of mercury. And these lungs are usually, when we're at rest, they, the pressure inside the lungs is equal to the pressure in the atmosphere. So right now when I stop, take a pause, pressures are equal. I send a message to my lungs, I expand my intercostal muscles, my diaphragm expands, my volume increases, my pressure decreases, and air moves in. So inspirator, inspiration is an active process. Generally in quiet breathing, expirator, expiration is a passive process. Obviously when we're exercising, we push air out, so it becomes a bit more active. So in this case, um, you can see here that it's working in a negative fashion. We add positive pressure into these patients. So this has an effect. This is a complete abnormal physiological behavior. It's like someone putting something against our mouth and blowing in and our lungs kind of pushing. So IPPV has a negative side effect on the cardiovascular system, primarily because it's inside the thoracic cavity. You have the heart in there and you have some big major blood vessels running alongside them. So a common cause, um, one of the common kind of consequences of providing IPPV is a drop in blood pressure overall, a drop in cardiac output, simply because you're causing positive pressure, it's abnormal, you're pushing against these v vessels, primarily the vena cava, which is bringing all the blood back to the heart, pressing against it, reducing the amount of blood that's coming back to the heart in that heartbeat, and overall you get a cardiac output drop. And we commonly see this when we have invasive blood pressure, Sometimes an oscillometric is a bit slower because your next, in five minutes, your reading might be lower. You may have stopped IPPV. But generally when you perform it and you have real-time readings, you do see this drop overall. And it can remain there if you continue to ventilate them. So you may need to provide them some support. So ultimately, that's the kind of application of IPPV I provide. I try and think about my tidal volume, the size of bag that I've chosen. Um, Ah, the inspiration expiration ratios as well. The frequency I go for, a frequency that matches the patient or is slightly more. And that's based on, is my patient hypercapnic? If I have a reading of 56 and my patient is breathing with a respirator of seven and I want to provide IPPV to bring down that uh, carbon dioxide level, I'll increase the respirate just because that's Generally, we're working with this. It's a minute volume equals tidal volume multiplied by respirate. So you're manipulating one or the other. Generally, as I said, sometimes I provide a higher pressure at 15. This will provide a higher tidal volume. And I add in the increased respirate. And that's to completely abolish the breathing, um, the respiratory drive, drive the carbon dioxide down. If you have a patient that you would like to do that because they have a high end tidal, 60, um, you can provide a tidal volume approximately of their weight, maybe 100, 200 mils, given the bag. If you have a 300, a three liter bag, it's a good idea to swap it down to a one liter bag if you're providing IPV just to remain safe. I would provide, you may or may not know your pressures. It's kind of, it can be a guesstimate. And with this knowledge, you can do it all safely. You don't necessarily need this equipment. Given your tidal volume, 
knowing that you're looking at the excursions of the chest and they seem natural, albeit slightly bigger. Um, a respiratory frequency that matches or is slightly increased. Generally we IPPV because then tidal is high, not because it's low, so generally it's increasing respirate. And then the ratio is another aspect that um, we tend to work with when we're ventilating them as well. This, all of this um, physiology applies to mechanical ventilation. This is what we're using when we're mechanical, mechanically ventilating them as well. So all that kind of manual IPPV can be brought through to mechanical. So when we do frequency, usually a natural um, ratio is your inspiratory time, let's say for argument's sake is one second, expiratory time is two seconds. Usually an inspiratory to expiratory ratio is one second to two seconds. So you breathe in one second, out two seconds. And a natural thing is to have a pause. Most humans, most animals, they take a pause. You see your capnograph line is zero, and then they exhale, then they inhale, and then it's zero because they're doing this natural pause. Um, I think it's important that we match that as well. We're already changing quite a lot by providing positive, increasing intrathoracic pressure, affecting blood pressure, that we try and match their natural physiology as much as possible. So what I do is let's say for example this is a very kind of mechanical ventilator setting but you i breathe in for one second out for two and stop in for one second out for two and stop and sometimes particularly when you i think apply this apnea can take some time i do be in ct and they ask how long do you need to provide apnea and i'll say two or three minutes just so i can have time to do it safely to do it in a pattern that suits the patient instead of this which is generally more what we see, they kind of go in, out, in, out, in, out, in, out, with no pause. Temporarily, the patient can handle this if your patient is systemically stable. Um, but again, what we're trying to apply is the knowledge and then to kind of look after them to the best of our ability. So what I would, this equals, I'm going to confuse, I used to be confused by this. So an inspiratory time of one second, expiratory time of two seconds. This is an inspiratory to expiratory ratio of one is to two. So this is an, um, an easy calculation, one second and then twice for the exhalation. If you inhale for two seconds, so you hold the bag, inhale over two seconds, you should allow to exhale for four seconds. So the ratio kind of changes like this. You can manipulate the ratio, but generally this will do most IPVB. We tend to only start manipulating ratios when we're kind of really trying to alter how they're breathing on a mechanical ventilator. Um, but a lot of my manual IPBV is just applying what I, again, what I think is a tidal volume, a PIP using this, and an inspiratory to expiratory ratio of one is to two seconds. And generally, I achieve apnea using this. Um, the only ones that are really tricky are cats. Cats are always a little bit different. They have a very high respiratory drive. Kittens and puppies are notoriously difficult to um, cause apnea in, which I think is great. I don't want them to abolish the respiratory drive. Um, and cats, similarly, they're very independent, even when you're trying to provide apnea. Um, and that's kind of how I would approach performing IPV safely. Does anyone have any questions on that side? No? Perfect. So how and why do we pre-oxygenate our patients? Um, there's some kind of studies done and there's a little bit again of physiology behind why we're providing and how we provide pre-oxygenation. So we have face mass versus flow by amount of time and what we're ultimately trying to do is increase the oxygen concentration of our functional residual capacity volume in our lungs. So I'll take you guys through that because um, again all of this understanding just adds that what we're doing when we anaesthetize patients is huge, it's important. There's a lot of background on it and there's a lot of physiology that goes into what we're doing. Um, so how and why? So face mask versus flow by. There's quite a notorious distaste for flow by. It's better than nothing. Um, but we achieve very low um, fractional inspired. So this kind of So it's just how much O2 you're breathing in. Right now we're breathing in 21%, so it's room air. 
So this is the terminology we would use. So we're, we're providing very low fraction inspired O2 with flow by. It has to stay by their nose. As soon as it moves, they're breathing room air again. And then it comes back. And sure, it's coming out at 100%. But studies show like maybe around 30%. We're bringing it up to around 30%. So from 21 to 30, it's better than nothing, absolutely. And a lot of what we do clinically is flow by because they don't tolerate face masks. And it's very often not, po even when I'm doing them every day, they're kind of not pre-medded enough yet. They're still moving their face quite a lot. Any patient that you can, the recommended pre-oxygenation is with a tight fitting face mask for three minutes. That's the kind of, and that will achieve maybe an FiO2, I may forget this number, but closer to kind of 60, 70%. And as you can see, the classic representation of this is a French Bulldog. They really benefit from having this pre-oxygenation and we'll go through why. Um, so when you have the volumes of a lung, you kind of have this classic graft and this is your tidal volume. This is the kind of, let's say, total capacity of your lungs. So you can see the tidal volume, what it represents really in the total capacity of lungs. It's a very small amount in the middle. That's why, really, they can tolerate quite a lot more. They can tolerate higher pressures. They can tolerate higher volumes because we haven't yet gone into this inspiratory reserve volume. But we know as humans, we work in our tidal volume all day, every day. And when we have to go, or, it's very uncomfortable. So we're just trying to ma maintain them in these volumes as well. So what are we trying to do when we're providing pre-oxygenation? So we have two little volumes that sit down here in what's called our expiratory reserve volume. You're gonna have to forgive my uh, writing on boards, it's not very good. Um, in this, we have two volumes. We have, I'm gonna get this the wrong way around. Expiratory reserve volume, residual volume. I'm pretty sure in here, we have, no, wrong way around. So we have our functional residual capacity. This is the area that we're trying to hit when we provide pre-oxygenation. So when we're breathing room air right now, my lungs have 21% room air inside of them. If I were to go apneic for any reason, my, this area in your lungs, when they collapse, so our, we inhale and we exhale, our lungs don't completely collapse. They're not, so they have a little bit left. They have what's called a functional, function, um, a residual volume and a functional reserve, vo, a functional residual volume, sorry. That functional residual volume keeps our lungs open and the oxygen CO2 exchange keeps going all the time. We don't breathe in and out and stop that. That's happening all the time. The blood is flowing through the lungs. It's picking up the oxygen that's inside this area and keeps us going all along. So we don't kind of have moments of hypoxia every time we stop breathing or hypoxemia every time we stop breathing. So what we want to do when we provide O2 to a patient is increase the oxygen inside this space. So if we're providing that face mask, tight fitting face mask, and we're providing, let's say, when we're doing it really well, 60%, that means when we induce that patient and we cause apnea and we're struggling maybe on some patients to intubate, they have 60% of O2 to work in that volume for the blood to keep coming and the O2 to keep going in and they desaturate much slower. So this study actually showed um, an example of that, of using the tight fitting face mask. Again, I can't completely remember. I think it was something similar, tight fitting face mask for three minutes with 100% oxygen versus a flow by. And in the patients that had the tight fitting face mask, they didn't desaturate until after 300 seconds versus the ones that didn't have it who desaturate after 30 seconds. So if you're kind of struggling to intubate in these conditions, you have a window. And the patients, again, that I would recommend doing this for are classic brachycephalic patients. A lot of our patients, as we intubate them, we don't pre-oxygenate them. They were maybe not, they didn't have a lot of respiratory depression. Maybe they didn't kind of come into a hypoxemic state. But when do we see cyanosis? When SpO2 drops below, or when PO2 drops below, I think it is around 90 millimeters of mercury, or 80 millimeters of mercury. 
Again, I'll take you through that. But that means this patient is already quite hypoxemic and it's 75% on the O2, on the SpO2 before we see cyanosis. So they could have had an element of hypoxia, we just missed it. And we kind of bounced them back pretty quick by giving them 100% oxygen, intubating, connecting them. What we're trying to do when we provide oxygen is pump up that functional residual capacity and it's, we certainly see improvement when we intubate. We generally pre-med brachycephalics and even if it's at the point of um, induction, kind of slower process, I get that face mask out, I pop it on and I try and pump up that kind of reserve of oxygen. So if someone struggles then to intubate, I have a window before they desaturate and they have a period of hypoxemia. Um, and that's, I think, the majority of physiology around why, how and why we um, pre-oxygenate our patients. How can I safely inflate an endo endotracheal tube cuff? Um, there's three techniques that are commonly used to inflate um, endotracheal cuffs. One of them is called the minimum occlusive a minimum occlusive volume, but we call it the minimum occlusive technique. Second one is the pilot balloon palpation and the cuff pressure manometers. So the minimum occlusive technique is the classic one where we intubate a patient, we connect them, and someone closes the APL valve, provides a positive pressure breath, and we listen for leaks. And then we inflate to the point that we don't hear any more leaks. Pilot balloon palpation, people inflate until they feel like they have a snug fit using the pilot balloon. And the cuff pressure manometers, which ultimately are the only ones that are giving us a graphical display of pressures and a safe estimate, estimation of um, the pressures we're providing into those cuffs, are these kind of items here. They're on the side if anyone wants to have a look at them. Um, and this, I would argue, is far more superior, um, simply because these do the job, but they only have 100 uses but they're about 12 pound. So generally people can get like 10 of them into a practice and 100 juices is better than none at all. These are around 120 pound. So it's a bit harder to kind of get them in sometimes and get people convinced about their use, but obviously their use is never ending. They never kind of run out of battery. So minimum occlusive technique. There was a study done in cats showing that let's say when we inflate a cuff, we want to achieve pressures of around 20 to 30 centimeters of H2O. This study showed that when we were providing minimum occlusive techniques versus pilot balloon palpation, minimum occlusive techniques were reaching pressures around 50 millimeters of mercury. Pilot balloon actually was achieving less, around 36. So they were kind of borderline, like you could say safer to do in terms of a blind um, inflation of cuffs. Cuff pressure manometers, you can see here between 20 and 30, this is the ideal area you want a, um, a cuff inflated in the trachea. If for some reason you're experiencing a leak at this point, you need to potentially increase the size of the endotracheal tube as opposed to keep inflating the tube. Again, another patient that this really benefits is cats because they have very sensitive tracheas and often People are nervous about using cuffed ET tubes. I don't know what point they kind of stopped using uncuffed ET tubes, but certainly um, in the referral practice I've worked in and worked in anesthesia, they use the cuffed ET tubes. Um, so I prefer to be able to provide a safe kind of way of inflating the cuff and go forward that way. Usually with cats, we go more towards 20. Again, everything's just lower. Eight mils per kilo, eight on the pip, and then 20 on the... Um, cuff pressure manometers. One of the reasons in minimum occlusive technique um, that they said in the study potentially people are achieving these very high pressures of 56 is because when we squeeze on a bag, what pressures are we providing? Are we going up to 20? Are we providing a tidal volume of 20 mils per kilo? There's no measurement of that. Someone is closing an APL valve completely and squeezing against a taut bag on a cat, on a dog, any patient at all it provides high pressures. So this pip, sorry, is potentially going up to 20 centimeters of H2O. And what do we keep hearing? A leak, a leak, a leak, a leak. Keep inflating. 
What pressures do a pa does a patient usually use when they're spontaneously breathing? Around one to two centimeters of H2O. That's what we're using now. When we mechanically or manually ventilate these patients, what are we going to be using? Certainly less than 20. We're going to be using eight, 10, 11, 12, something like this. If we go to the higher pressures and we've leak tested them using this method, we may find we get a leak for some reason. We decide we have to use high pressures for this patient and then suddenly you may be like, oh, there's a bit of a leak in the system, which usually, again, it's mechanical ventilation and you see the leak. What's happening when people do uh, squeeze the bag like this, and I know because I've done it for years, squeeze, do you hear a leak, squeeze, do you hear a leak, is that we're using far too high pressures. They're not physiologically re relevant. If that patient spontaneously breathes, he'll never reach a pressure high enough to cause a leak in that system. So this is trying to abolish that. So if we drop it down to 20, patients breathing at one, two centimeters of H2O will never leak. And if we provide IPPV or manual IPPV or mechanical IPPV, we'll equally never achieve pressures like this. So we'll never cause a leak. So this is kind of the pitfall with these two ways of inflating cuffs. We very rarely see the fallout of this, but again, it's just, as I was studying and as I was learning more and more about this kind of side of nursing, I realized how much the kind of little things mattered and probably how much the anesthetists were taking in to account every time they were anesthetizing a patient. And it's kind of, you can bring all that with you to the table. You can bring it clinically, straight away that this is how now when I we still do the minimum occlusive technique we do not have enough of these to anesthetize 20 patients a day and have it in every tray um, but as I do it I know now I just give less pressures and when they're like I don't hear a leak I'm like great we'll stop there um, because the chances of us having achieved a significant enough kind of cuff is is quite high um, any questions on cuff inflation? Feel free to have a look at the equipment after. If there's anything you guys would like to get into your practice, you want to know where it comes from, if it's worth having, worth not having, just let me know. So what to do when troubleshooting a low SpO2 reading fails? Um, I put this up primarily because I had it the other day and very rarely when you have an SpO2 failure, it's a true failure. You know, we're like, wet the tongue. Must be something got to do with the monitor. And for the first time, I was like, oh, I think this is real hypoxemia. So it's like a little bit exciting. <laughs> um, so troubleshooting versus true hypoxemia. So what are we going to do first? We're going to troubleshoot. I may have in the back of my mind that I have a patient that came in dyspneic, may have a pleural effusion, a pneumothorax. I may be keeping in my mind that if an SpO2 is dropping, it could be very much real. Um, but it takes five, 10 seconds to run through a quick troubleshoot. Um, and you're using probably the rest of your monitoring and uh, an idea of what's been done to the patient as something dramatically changed to cause this drop in SpO2. So troubleshooting. Um, vasoconstriction, number one, um, for whatever reason, they could be very cold. A common one I see is when we give dexmedetomidine, we often give it as a kind of a bolus during uh, procedure. And I see people kind of panicking, trying to replace the SpO2 and it just drops because you have that kind of um, predominant vasoconstriction effect with the uh, metatomidine or um, dexmedetomidine. Hypotension, um, they really have to be hypotensive for me to lose an SpO2 in my experience. Um, anastomosis of the tongue, very common in cats and small dogs. The, the clip is just very kind of tight, squeezes the blood vessels uh, and equipment malfunction. So a common thing we do for anastomosis of the tongue is add a swab, add something. Some people put the tip of a needle in just to kind of create an opening in the clip, but I find this just creates too much of an opening and I don't get a reading. So I kind of let, like the, the warm, damp swab a little bit better, just creates like a barrier between the tongue and I get a much better reading. Then the other side of it is a true hypoxemia. Um, there's five classic um, presentations of a true hypoxemia. Uh, low FiO2, so as I explained, just a low fractional spired O2. Um, that could be 20% for a patient that's compromised, that's dyspneic. We see it when they come in, they're dyspneic, they need oxygen. This could be a true representation of hypoxemia. We classically don't see it in anesthesia because we're on 100% oxygen. 
so it's not one of our primary um, thoughts when we have hypoxemia under anaesthetic. Hypoventilation is um, a more kind of common one, I would say, but again, it has to be profound hypoventilation. You really have to get a high end tidal um, to disrupt the kind of um, blood gas equation and to kind of cause a drop in the PO2. Uh, pulmonary disease, very classic, we see it, pneumothorax, pleural effusion, um, VQ mismatch is a word that gets thrown around all the time and it took me quite a few years to even come close to understanding when an anaesthetist walked in and they're like, oh, it's probably VQ mismatch and you're like, what are you saying? Um, diffusion impairment and a sixth one is more like the cardiac condition, so a PDA can become hypoxemic and I've never experienced it um, but you get like that anaesthesia high of like wanting to experience it and then you think don't be sick but I would love to like see what happens because the anaesthetist is like there's nothing you can do and I'm like I don't believe it um, so these are the classic representations of hypoxemia and we're using a graph to kind of understand what the SpO2 is doing in relation to your oxygen level in your blood. So we're using what's called the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve. So this curve, let's say you have your SpO2 up here and your PaO2 down here. There's a classic representation, this is going to be a very bad diagram, of uh, oxygen Dissociation curve, sorry. So you have your 100% O2 up here, SpO2, and you have, let's say, your 100% or 100 millimeters of mercury PaO2. So a note about PaO2, it's the, it's the amount of dissolved oxygen in the blood. So when we're reading an SpO2, we're indirectly trying to assess the dissolved oxygen in blood. And when we're breathing room air, which is 21% oxygen, our PO2 should be five times that approximately. So it should be 100. And that's why generally this graph comes up to 100. Because we generally do this on, a, on room air. It's a bit more relevant on room air, but it gets really scary when it becomes relevant in anesthesia on 100% oxygen. So you get this kind of sigmoid curve. And let's say you have your 100%, and we know that until, let's say, our, it drops below 90%, we're not kind of facing a real, why isn't anyone worried at 91, 92, 93, 94? There could be real readings, we could be having a mild hypoxemia, but they're not that relevant, the patient can maintain oxygenation and avoid kind of a true hypoxemia, hypoxia state with this. But when we get to 90%, we're generally dropping to somewhere around 80 millimeters of mercury. So if I have a, a dog here and I put him on an SpO2 and he's 90% and it's not any of my troubleshooting, I really think this patient could potentially be suffering a hypoxemia. We're kind of es guesstimating that this PO2 is around 80 millimeters of mercury. If it drops to 75% approximately, that's when we see our cyanosis typically. And we've gotten to a real bad situation of 60 millimetres of mercury. This is hypoxemia. Anaesthetists generally won't diagnose hypoxemia until they see this value on an arterial blood gas. The rest are kind of, the, this is like, let's say severe. We have a mild hypoxemia and we have none at all up here in our little window up here. And you can see that as we add 100% oxygen, it, it will never really drop our SpO2. If it's dropping, that's the true concern. Why is it dropping? Because we're providing these guys with 100% oxygen. So if, let's say, for example, for argument's sake, we're providing 100% oxygen, but we never truly are, because the inhalant, if you're using it, will take up a percentage of that. Usually we're achieving 97, 98. Then you multiply this by five. I expect when I take an arterial blood gas, for my PO2 to be 500 millimeters of mercury, somewhere around that. I'm not too concerned if it's 450, because again, we're probably just in this window where if it's 80, an anaesthetist may be like, oh, strange, we're having some sort of hypoxemia. 
um, we can provide some oxygen. And then when we get down to the 60s, we start getting real itchy. So with this patient, with these patients, when we are kind of having SpO2 issues and we're looking and kind of assessing hypoxemia, this is the graph that we're using. This graph does some tricky things. It shifts to the right and to the left. Um, I don't, I could talk all day about this graph, so I'm trying not to like get too intense. <laughs> um, if you have any questions after, you can ask me. But for the estimate, what we're trying to do and what, what we're trying to say here about troubleshooting in SpO2, this is generally where kind of our minds are at when we're thinking about what's this patient doing really with hypoxemia. So I had an interesting case actually last week that had real hypoxemia. Um, so this was, um, let's say, a 30 kilo, I think she was a Rhodesian Ridgeback down as a crossbreed. And she was having a CT, a bal, um, and a bronchoscopy and a bal. And I bring her to CT, and in CT and stern, you can see I'm providing IPPV here, I'm providing apnea, and I'm recording my PIP. I'm using quite a high PIP of 14, because this patient actually has lung pathology. And I'm finding it, I feel when I kind of um, inflate her lungs, her chest is not moving that much. So I'm providing a slightly higher um, PIP to try and achieve that apnea. All along, kind of her SpO2 is reading fine. Her intidal is a bit high. You can see it here. 56, 64, 62, 63. There'll be kind of a question coming up about when do we kind of respond to intidal? Um, what kind of types of hypercapnia do we tolerate, not tolerate? I had an, an inkling that this patient was not ventilating extremely well. I don't have any volumetric measuring, so I don't know. But I can kind of assess just from kind of her pathology and what we saw on the CT, this um, patient had a lung mass and it was taking up quite a lot of the right lung. So there's no way this patient is managing to use her total t uh, volume, tidal volume. And in hindsight, when you see this kind of lung mass, you don't need to provide the actual tidal volume of this patient. I do not need to provide 200 mils to this 20 kilo animal. She does not have that lung volume. It's taken up by some sort of growth. So I can reduce my pressures and maybe increase my rest rate in this case. Maybe I wouldn't go for high in tidals, high pressures. Instead, I would breathe a little bit quicker. Try and maintain my inspiratory to expiratory ratio, but I wouldn't be so casual as to give a breath every so often, have a chat. I would be like very focused on kind of bringing down this end tidal. Um, we moved to minor ops and we did a bronchoscopy. And again, we're in sternal, so we're tolerating this very well. And what we accidentally found, in, or incidentally found, was a foreign body in the abdomen. So these guys wanted to rotate this patient into lateral recumbency and do um, a gastroscopy. And when I flipped her into lateral recumbency, we had this kind of nice decrease here in SpO2. And I'm like, oh, I'll do all my usual things. Wet the tongue, check if it's a, like equipment malfunction. Um, and again here, I'm dropping to 88. And I'm like, oh, that's a bit unsettling. And I had a really good trace. And this patient had a lung mass, I think, in the right lung. And we flipped her into, I thought, oh, on the top. Um, she had a mass in the right lung, and we, or in the left lung, and we turned her into right lateral. So what did we do? We collapsed the healthy lung. And we have the unhealthy lung uppermost for doing the gastroscopy. So this patient started decompensating. And in this situation, we employ, um, mechanical ventilation because I was IPPVing her and I was not achieving bringing up the SpO2 and when you get to this point you can tell now this is a bit scary why are we becoming down to 80% when we're providing 100% oxygen we should be up here at 500 why are we somewhere down here at 80 what's happened this is the scary drop when you're breathing room air, it's not that scary. You've dropped from 100 to 80. It doesn't sound that dramatic, 20 millimeters of mercury. When you're on 100% oxygen, you drop from 450 to 80. It gets a bit kind of unsettling. So in this case, um, we drew an arterial blood gas to check if it was accurate. And the PaO2 was 84, which is extremely abnormal. Again, what have we done? We've come down here. So even with 100% oxygen, and ventilation, albeit manual, and we're just starting mechanical ventilation, we're not managing to correct this hypoxemia. So this is a true hypoxemia. 
Um, and I'll show you the blood gas and just kind of talk you through what we did. So we started ventilating and we ventilated quite aggressively. Um, so we added kind of a value here called PEEP um, and a PIP of 26. And I don't have a tidal volume reading, sadly, because I was not in theatre with a spirometer. I was outside in a minor ops room and we have a portable ventilator and we didn't have a spirometry on this patient. Um, so I was watching her lung movements and I would say they weren't very big for the kind of level of pressures that we were trying to provide. Um, the PEEP is a, like a little bit more advanced, a little bit more for mechanical ventilation, but that kind of function, when your lungs collapse, let's say you have an intrinsic PEEP of three centimeters of H2O, now when we stop breathing our lungs stay open, we have all those volumes. What we're trying to do is open that. So we keep the alveoli open and we keep the gas exchange still going. We try and get oxygen in and CO2 out. And what we're doing is we're kind of, and again, this is extremely abnormal for the patient. They do not like this. We're keeping a positive pressure in the thoracic cavity all the time. It's complete. So generally, this affects their cardiac output even more. And you get this, this drop in blood pressure here. So in this case, we managed to bring the SpO2 up but it took a good maybe 20 minutes to get it back up. And we moved the patient back into stern, uh, sternal and we aborted doing the gastroscopy and a lateral recumbency. And this is a picture of the arterial blood gas that we got. So you can see what's interesting is when I was ventilating this patient, I was having an end tidal of 57. And I had a real carbon dioxide level in my blood of 82. So I'm missing carbon dioxide. It's going around the blood and I'm not managing to get it out through the respiratory system. So this is an issue when you start getting these kind of increases in PCO2, so the blood concentration of carbon dioxide versus what the patient is breathing out and we're indirectly measuring, which is 57. And this is where you suspect you start getting a VQ mismatch. So you're having a ventilation perfusion mismatch. So these lungs are potentially being ventilated all the CO2 is being sent there, but there's no perfusion, or there's no ventilation. So for whatever reason, there's a bunch of alveoli that blood is going to and going, here, have all the CO2, and there's no air there to pick it up. There's no air to take in the CO2, or the O2, and there's no air to take out the CO2. So you have to correct this when this starts happening. And this is what they refer to as that kind of phenomena of ventilation perfusion mismatch, which we very often cause when we do anesthesia, but not to this degree. This is generally some sort of pathology that's kind of starting to cause this. Whether it's just lying an 80 kilo dog in lateral recumbency for four hours without moving them and the lung that they're lying on is just completely collapsed. Um, SO2 was 92, so it was a little bit low, and then the PO2 was the real kick in the teeth. Um, we didn't actually take an arterial blood gas after this. Um, we did the remainder of the GA, the SpO2 came up and then we moved the patient to ICU and they did do, um, they followed up from there. The patient continued on flow by oxygen. Um, but just we completely decompensated this patient just because the procedures we needed to per perform, but equally the pathology that she was already having. So it's quite interesting when it really starts happening. Um, and either we did consider kind of aborting the the GA um, and stopping the gastroscopy. But again, it was an older patient. She was already under anesthetic um, and she had the foreign body. So we wanted to try and achieve getting it out. And at this stage, we were starting to kind of get back to normal values with the SpO2. But I think it would have been interesting again at this, when you're in the thick of it, you don't think about it, but it would have been interesting to get another blood gas. And then we had to kind of tackle this blood pressure because we're just causing her kind of a big cardiac out <laughs> drop, ventilating this aggressively. Sorry, excuse me. Um, so this was um, a question. So when your capnograph is not between 35 and 45, how do I troubleshoot this? This, I guess it depends uh, what you've done and what you're kind of facing. So are we dealing with hypercapnia or hypocapnia? We allow permissive hypercapnia, generally in anesthesia, in um, certainly in the practices I've been working with and with the patients I'm working with, knowing their kind of history and what procedures they're having done, the type of patient that it is, this kind of 55 millimetres, oh, I'm sorry, missing my M, 
millimetres of mercury is permissive hypercapnia and we do allow that. We don't kind of panic if it's not between 35 and 45, um, <coughs> pending the kind of whole picture of the patient. Um, hypoventilation can be one, so the patient just isn't taking enough breaths, they're breathing at seven breaths per minute, what are we going to do? Provide kind of manual IPPV, increase the respiratory rate and blow off some of that carbon dioxide. The only tricky part with providing manual IPPV is they tend to like it, especially if they're hypoventilating. Their respiratory drive is already quite low because they have a high CO2. When they're conscious, they would breathe all that off. Why are they allowing? I would not lie here and let my CO2 become 60, but I'm unconscious. I have no control over that, so I allow it to go up. So generally, I find if you ventilate these patients that are 55 millimeters of mercury, you're like two hours later, like, I've created a monster. Um, so if they remain stable, we do tolerate it. Um, hyperthermia, they just have increased metabolic rate and therefore more carbon dioxide. So that could be something that needs treating, checking. Um, and very often with hyperthermia, they can have an interesting effect where they have a high end tidal, but they, are actu they do actually have a high respiratory rate because they're trying to pant under anesthetic. I've seen them kind of trying to pant, but they're not driving their carbon dioxide down as you would expect. Increased cardiac output. So you may have had a patient that was hypotensive and you, you'll see a few videos of us treating low blood pressure and the end tidal does increase. So it increases with blood pressure. Naturally, you're getting more blood to the lungs and you're shipping off more of that CO2. So sometimes it's, and it's not something we tend to treat because it's generally something we had hypotensive, low end tidal, we treat the blood pressure, we get a slightly higher end tidal and we're quite happy to be honest, we'll leave it at. It never goes up to like 60 or 70, but sometimes you can see if you weren't ventilating them appropriately, a massive kind of 60 millimeters of mercury and think, where did that come from? But it could be that you've just kind of bumped up the cardiac output. Um, traumatic brain injury, they just have uh, damage to their respiratory center. They tend to hypoventilate. They don't blow off enough of their carbon dioxide. In this case, it is actually necessary to treat these patients. Your ventilation settings, are you ventilating appropriately? Maybe not, so we can adjust them. Resistance to breathing, this is a classic one for um, brachycephalics. They have a massive resistance to breathing, huge interthoracic pressure. And very often when we anaesthetize them, the first end tidal reading you get is 55, 60. And often you are inclined to IPPV them and bring down that carbon dioxide. There is a very, possible situation that they're, they can tolerate that. Their end tidal is very much, is probably higher when they're conscious. So they've actually shifted their response curve. So now a Labrador that's walking around all healthy will not tolerate an end tidal of 55, will start panting. A Frenchie that's asleep will have an end tidal of 55 and be like, well, this is life. I'm a little bit hypercapnic. <laughs> so generally when we anesthetize them, this is what happens. I, I tend to ventilate them because I have ventilators and I'm going to be doing maybe long procedures on them and they're only going to get more hypercapnic, hypoventilate more. They're going to be more lazy about breathing. They're exhausted of breathing. So I tend to actually ventilate these patients even though it's a permissive type hypercapnia and they're stable and I would tolerate it in a Labrador, let's say. Um, but I feel like I'm giving them a break from breathing when I do it. So it depends what you have available to you when you kind of anesthetize them, but don't panic if the first kind of capnograph reading you get is 55. You're like, this is the breed. And you can by all means provide IPPV, but these are another type of patient that love for you to breathe for them. So they tend to kind of give over very quickly and then you get stuck. Um, and then capnoperitoneum, that's just if you're doing a laparoscopic spay and the blood is absorbing some of the carbon dioxide, it can, it can increase. Um, again, if it increases to something like 50, I might tolerate it, 55. And if it starts doing anything too crazy, I'll start ventilating them just to drive it down. And then hopefully that covers like a little bit of what you're trying to do or what you see when you're trying to do. But if it doesn't, just let me know if you have kind of different um, considerations. Um, less than 30 millimeters of mercury, feline patient. They generally have lower um, entitles, so we tolerate that. I'll happily have a GA with a cat with 28 millimeters of mercury. Um, I'll actually tolerate much less hypercapnia in a cat. It means that they're really struggling with resistance in the breathing system and they don't like 
um, carbon dioxide, they get acidic very easily. So we tend to actually, I will not really tolerate 50, 55 in a cat. I would just breathe for them, ventilate them. Um, hyperventilation, they're just blowing off more carbon dioxide. Hypothermia, again, kind of like this combination of decreased cardiac output, they're just getting less um, carbon dioxide to the body. A sudden pulmonary embolism, so you just get a massive block to a bunch of the alveoli, less um, carbon dioxide being sent out. And equipment leak is another kind of classic. So hopefully that covers the majority of uh, capnograph troubleshooting, but leaves most people with the, how do I ventilate a patient for two hours? Or um, definitely it becomes a little bit easier if you're allowing a few of them to be a little bit more hypercapnic and kind of just not tolerating it ones that you think really, really need a break, like French bulldogs or traumatic brain injury dogs or cats. So this is, for example, like a chaotic capnograph. <laughs> and this looks like, I, I, to be honest, I just found all these on my phone. So I don't know. I was like, ah. Oh. <laughs> um, this patient, I would ventilate. I would just have no tolerance for whatever this panting is. This is like your huffy white dog, kind of classic. <laughs> and you're trying to give propofol just to stop it. Um, this is either, this can be many things, it can be depth for example, you've just anaesthetised the patient and in the first five, ten minutes maybe you need to add a little bit more drugs, maybe you need to get them to a lower depth and they'll finally kind of chill out, but that's sometimes a little bit of like a fairy tale that you tell yourself and they do or don't. I've had patients that are definitely asleep and every time they sort of start regaining spontaneous respiration they breathe like this and you're like, ah! Um, so in this patient, I would ventilate them or I would try either balance their plane of anesthesia if that's what you have available. You can add some alpha 2s or you can maybe try and kind of br bring their depth. So you could potentially IPPV this patient for a while because when they're breathing like this, they're just not getting ISO in and getting it to the alveoli, getting the level of, of ISO up in the system. So they're just not falling asleep. They're staying in this kind of awake state kind of light plane of anesthesia. So you could do that and then hopefully over time they start um, breathing a little bit better. This patient, for example, I would leave at 54. I'm not concerned in any way. Normal heart rate, blood pressure is good. I have a fraction inspired CO2 that's potentially dead space for us because we have a lot of connectors just because of positioning of patients. But yeah, in this case, I wouldn't ventilate this patient unless I was you know, maybe we ventilate these patients if we think they're going to be under anaesthetic for three or four hours and this is not going to get better. So then we'll ventilate them, but it's more of a preemptive than a treatment at the time. We don't feel the need to kind of treat that at the time. This is just um, a very bad picture, but <laughs> shows ventilation and an end tidal of 51. And you can see sometimes we ventilate them. This is our PIP here of 14, so that number I was talking about. And this is the tidal volume approximately, I don't know, 147. Um, even when we're ventilating them, sometimes it's 50. And we don't necessarily, again, if the patient's blood pressure stable, heart rate stable, we don't drive up ventilation just to achieve 35 to 45. We know that we've completely abolished the respiratory drive. We've given drugs that have caused respiratory depression. We expect some sort of increase in, in carbon dioxide. It's quite normal. And it's kind of pleasant to see when you don't have it, you're more concerned. So I think anywhere between, I would leave this patient and kind of um, ventilate them personally at 51. And you very rarely will get an anesthetist that will run in the room and be like, ah, you're in tidal, um, unless they're concerned in another manner. This is a cat um, breathing at 50. I don't like this. So this is when I kind of, interfere with cats. This generally is one of two things. You've just induced them, you've completely abolished the respiratory drive, um, or they've got a lot of resistance in the breathing system. So T-piece they tend to cope well with, as we all know, but we're like leaning a little bit more towards using circles with smaller tubes. They're low resistance, so they should be able to move the valves. But you have a sticky valve, you have a small cat, this may not be the case. Um, you can do many things, you can change them to a T-piece, you can wait, maybe you've just induced them and they need 15, 20 minutes to come off the induction agent and they'll start to increase their respirates or you can ventilate them. Um, and generally cats that have a, have a high end tidal despite all other cats will allow ventilation because the respiratory drive is already quite low 
having this high and tidal um, so I will ventilate this patient and I will be already thinking I'm s already nervous to ventilate this patient because this blood pressure isn't great but this for me looks like uh, I've just induced the patient like a classic kind of scenario and they've started breathing um, so this could just be a post induction blood pressure but if I was going to ventilate this patient I'd be a bit concerned about um, the blood pressure and it probably comes down to that nice little heart rate they don't like their low heart rates either I just thought I'd put this up, why do we read lead 2 on ECG? It's because it crosses the axis of the heart primarily. So if we go from right arm to left arm, we're reading in lead 1. That's why we get the really tiny little reading. It doesn't have a, generate a big electrical um, pulse or an amplitude. So generally what we're trying to achieve is a right arm to left leg down through a lead 2. It's all got to do with vectors in the heart um, that we don't need to go into, but Generally, this is why we stick with lead two. And lead three, we get quite a similar reading, but there can be like slight differences that if you're trying to ascertain if there's something going on with the patient or there's like a change in that ECG, obviously it's better that we read it in the way that we're used to reading it. So this is generally why we go for a lead two. And it's based on a guy called Einthoven, and that's Einthoven's triangle. Um, we usually read three lead ECG in veterinary. There's six lead, 12 lead used in humans, which can do a lot more um, investigation, can kind of find a lot more conditions that we don't generally pick up with a, a three lead ECG. Um, I'm very conscious of time. I tend to do this. Um, I can do this one and then I'll stop. There is more. Um, so how can I approach hypertension? So there's four real kind of mechanisms of hypertension that I'm considering when I have a patient. Vasodilation, bradycardia, decreased preload, and decreased contractility. And a lot of what we think about when we think about the cardiovascular system are these kind of two um, So we have cardiac output equals heart rate multiplied by stroke volume. And then we have mean arterial pressure equals cardiac output must multiply by systemic vascular resistance. So when we're attempting to treat blood pressure, we're thinking about these things. So is the heart rate sufficient of the patient? Could I increase it? Let's say we're dealing with hypertension because that's just the hallmark of anesthesia. Um, are we dealing with heart rate? Is our heart rate sufficient? Are we thinking about increasing or decreasing it? Um, stroke volume usually has a few different aspects associated with it. It has what's called preload, which you can see there on the screen. If you have your heart and your veins going in, it's a very kind of crude picture, um, and we're sending all our blood back. If we have little blood or a lot of blood, that's our preload. do we need to kind of pump up the intravascular volume? Then we have afterload. When we send blood out of the heart, what's it pumping against? Is it pumping against big wide vessels or is it pumping against very narrow vessels? So this is your classic representation of vasodilation and vasoconstriction. So you would imagine that if it was pumping against really narrow little uh, vessels, your blood pressure would increase. So sometimes we manipulate this to increase blood pressure. And then contractility. Terrible writing. Um, so this is just how well the heart is beating. And we often manipulate, I would say, all three with all of the cocktail of drugs we give. We give probably Dexmed, we give methadone, then we give isoflurane, then we've given a good old dose of propofol, alfax, and we've just lowered all of this. And that's why our first reading is always a bit poor. I tend to, if I'm not concerned about the patient, wait 15, 20 minutes just to see if like, it's all false and they're actually great before I kind of run and try and fix it all. Um, and then what we're doing with the mean arterial pressure is we're using all of this from cardiac output. And then this is your kind of peripheral vascular resistance. So is there any kind of mass vasodilation anywhere, pooling of blood? 
um, a classic kind of drop in systemic vascular resistance will be an epidural because you kind of paralyze all the vessels in the hind limbs. You cause this pooling of blood. And we're trying to manipulate these things when we're treating hypertension. Um, and this is generally the hallmark of any drug that an anaesthetist will choose or any course of treatment that they will choose to improve a blood pressure. They'll be thinking about these kind of mechanisms of hypertension and they'll be seeing where they can kind of intervene. And luckily in anaesthesia, as with a lot of things, I think we're like always thinking, oh, this must be a magical different type of hypertension. It's generally the same. So we're very lucky that we can generally use quite common treatments, which means that we reduce the kind of risk safety factor. So the more, co the more familiar we are with the drugs, the more familiar we, we are with the, the kind of pathophysiology of the hypertension, Classically, it's like a little bit of vasodilation, bradycardia. We've caused a bit of decreased contractility and probably decreased our preload. So there's like different treatments for these. Um, a lot of them are anaesthetists and drugs, but there's a few that are more like inhalant would be your classic vasodilation. So you can classically reduce ISO if your depth is okay. Bradycardia is one of the main causes of hypertension in a cat. They don't like these drops in heart rates. Uh, anything less than 90 beats per minute in a cat is considered bradycardia, but they still don't really like 100 beats per minute. You did a pre-exam on this patient and it was 160, 180 beats per minute. It's already dropped by half by the time we anaesthetize them. Decreased preload, just because of that vasodilation, there's less blood going back to the heart. Uh, contractility, ISO, propofol, alfax. Um, they're your main kind of ACP if you've given it. Um, they're your kind of primary contractility, but it's like a cocktail of um, abuse really to the cardiovascular system. Um, so vasodilation you can support with inhalant, bradycardia. It depends what you have available. Um, and I realize I'm very blessed because we have anesthetists and we have a lot of medications that they use. They kind of ca classically reach for the anticholinergics to treat bradycardia. Um, decrease preload, this is your classic, I'm going to give a fluid bolus. And this works, I've often seen patients and really often see patients respond to an increase in preload supported by a crystalloid fluid bolus. They've been fasting overnight, they haven't been drinking, they probably already have tacky mucous membranes. Sometimes I'm like, oh, just give it to them, they're thirsty. Um, so, and very often if it's hypertensive, I mean, sometimes you don't see a response and it's, it's a bigger kind of, a bigger um, fish to fry but definitely I had a patient today that was on invasive blood pressure and every time I gave like a little flu bolus you could see it just improving and there may be a type of um, tachyphylaxis to, or like you know the it may stop responding you may be able to give two and have like a good time and then you have to reconsider what you're going to do and decrease contractility other than reaching again for kind of your more um, blood pressure treating medications. The contractility is really affected by your probe fall wearing off after 20, 30 minutes, that could improve it. Um, classically, you remove isoflurin and everything is like beautiful again. Um, so that really kind of affects things. So if we can get that lowered and balance the plane of anesthesia with some other medications, that can be beneficial. Or adding um, analgesia, if they're kind of really reactive and you find you're having to use higher isoflurin levels just to keep them from um, having nociception to surgery and I think maybe I have some like images so for example with this I would be kind of giving you a little bit of what I'd be thinking about when I see these kind of blood pressures it's obviously completely patient dependent it's just a little bit of um, kind of chat between us all so here we have hypertension this is on invasive blood pressure and this patient's heart rate's 48 it's a canine so it's not particularly low unless it's, for example, a very small patient, but there's a classic small patient that will have this heart rate, and that's a dash hound. They will have a heart rate of 48, and it does bring down their blood pressure. I often find if you treat the, the heart rate, you do improve their blood pressure. Um, but if this was, let's say, a mastiff, I'm not going to be kind of running outside and be like, oh, it's 48, we need to treat it. But in some cases, I do find the anaesthetist treating a little bit the blood pressure because it might just bump it up a bit and then just bring this up to like 70 where we're happy. Um, and if not, we might go further into more of our kind of vasopressors and kind of improving contractility, increasing heart rate through other means of drugs. Um, but this blood pressure, guess, makes me a little bit uneasy.
Um, and you can see my ISO level is around 1.14. Uh, I tend actually not to run super low on ISO unless I have a lot of Mac sparing CRIs. I'm not that uh, brazen with ISO. I prefer them to stay asleep. Um, so unless someone's going to be giving me CRIs to remove my ISO or to drop it really, and I, a lot of us in referral practice, we lose the ability to check depth just because of the posi positioning of the patients. Um, and I tend not to kind of run them too low on ISO. I tend to actually go the opposite direction and ask for help. I check with Dinesis, I say, do you want me to lower it anymore? I'm not particularly comfortable doing it. Um, and they'll say, no, I'm quite happy with that like level. If we can check the depth, I'm happy with the depth. Let's kind of reach for some medications. Um, but yeah, I tend not to run them too low on ISO. This one, for example, I would say our heart rate is sufficient in this patient. And we still have our low blood pressure, our ISO level's not too high, so we will be thinking about something else. We won't be thinking about increasing directly this heart rate. We will be thinking more um, like a vasopressor, whether that's kind of a short acting one, a longer acting one, pending the procedure and the patient that we're dealing with. But, um, and you can see sometimes the oscillometric actually coincides really well with the, I tend to have them running both, and in certain patients it coincides really well in other patients less so, in arrhythmias less so. Um, but you get this kind of perfect 10 to 30 kilo patient that the oscillometric actually reads very close to most of my invasive blood pressures. So I'm quite impressed with the oscillometric on these mind rays in certain cases. Um, because the more we read, the more the books are like, no, nah, you can't really trust it, but do. And you're like, okay. Um, so it's a bit unsettling. And then this patient, I would, this is a cat. I would aim for increasing that heart rate. This patient's bradycardic um, and freezing. So the classic thing is that they get bradycardic when they're cold. They need less ISO when they're cold. It's max sparing when they're hypothermic. So I could maybe risk dropping a little bit more, but cats tend to like not wake up like normal patients and they tend to just, you look under and they're like, like twitching their ears so they make me again a little bit more unsettled to like reduce their ISO so I'd probably reach for some medication probably your classic kind of glycoatropine something like that to increase the heart rate and hopefully that'll just drive it up enough so it's just like on the lower end of kind of everything pending the patient um, and they do like a very interesting thing when they're hypothermic and they don't respond to the drug that we give to uh, increase heart rate so it's a bit frustrating Sometimes you have to think outside the box when they're this cold. And the other thing is to warm them up. But let's say this patient's having an x lap. What can I do to warm this patient up at this point? Um, I've kind of already failed in keeping the patient warm. So it'll have to be like a, a post-anesthetic warm-up. Um, this is maybe a video. Actually, I have this. Oh, yeah. This is my patient today, actually. Uh, it was, no, maybe it wasn't. Yes, it was. I was just doing a Tika today in a cat and I gave 10 microgram uh, per kilo of glyco. So these drugs, your glyco and your atropine, we all know atropine, we have it for our CPR. Glyco is just a brother of atropine. It's less intense, the response, um, and kind of a longer duration of action. And you can see that this heart rate was 96 and I've given the atropine and it's increasing at 20 microgram per kilo. So usually our, our CPR um, concentration of atropine is 40 microgram per kilo. So I'm giving half of, let's say, what we use in CPR. So generally, atropine does the trick. And this cat, of course, was like, oh, I'll increase my heart rate by 10. And my blood pressure, not at all. <laughs> so I kept like running back outside and be like, no, nope. <laughs> again. Um, so yeah, he was unresponsive twice to glyco. Usually cats respond really well to glyco, but they'll always be like good crack. They'll like make you kind of, everything you teach and that's clinical, I think you get into practice with cats and you're like, nope, none of it works. Um, and then, yeah. It can. So with glyco, it's a bit of a tricky drug. Usually when you use lower doses of five microgram per kilo, there's receptors obviously that it works on. And most of our receptors I visualize like this in a nice big mushroom. And there's a pre and there's a post. And these drugs will always be coming in and acting somewhere, doing something. So what these drugs do is they come in and they block 
what's called a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine from going on to receptor and in doing that they block the parasympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system is our bradycardia rest and digest I'm going to bed sympathetic nervous system is like I'm pumped my heart rate's up my blood pressure's up so then when you block this system you drive the sympathetic nervous system up you give it usually the parasympathetic nervous system predominates we're all sitting here calm none of us are like mommy but none of you so I'm a little bit sympathetic um, but usually we abolish this parasympathetic nervous system and we drive the heart rate up and that's how this, these drugs work sometimes when you give them particularly at a low dose so our classic doses are <coughs> 5 to 20 let's say for glyco sorry about this like if you want any information after this please let me know um, and you can see I use 10 when Anissa says 5 you're like Okay. Seven, yeah, seven is like, I can't decide. <laughs> seven, it's like 100, but it's not. And you give five. So when you give the low dose, what it does is it goes to the presynaptic and it causes an increase in ACH being deployed. So what have you done? You've whacked the parasympathetic nervous system up, so you actually lower the heart rate. But this is generally a transient thing. I've experienced it as a non-transient thing, generally stays, and then you kind of give another five microgram per kilo to bring it up to the 10. So this is what it's doing. It's going to the presynaptic, it's causing an increase in the ACH being deployed down to the receptors. The parasympathetic nervous system is kind of um, having a whale of a time and you're panicking because all you see is blocks, like P wave, P wave, P wave, and you're like, oh Jesus, that's the opposite of what I wanted. Glyco generally can take three to five minutes to work, so when we have this impact, we wait the five minutes to see if it goes the other direction, and it goes to the postsynaptic, blocks it, and the sympathetic nervous system kicks in. So we'll generally wait it out, or if we're kind of already unsettled, some people, you know, it's your first time seeing it, it's very unnerving when you see it, you just add, add more of the drug, add another five, and generally you get this effect, and your heart rate will increase. So generally that's your kind of and atropine does that much less. Atropine usually kind of pumps your, should do this, block the parasympathetic nervous system, but it does it much quicker. Sympathetic nervous system like wax in. Um, but this cat was like, oh, don't worry about it. I'm good. Mm -hmm. um, so he was, yeah, he was a pain in my bum today. <laughs> um, so I'm aware it's quarter to nine and I could talk forever about anesthesia. Um, I do have a few other things and I just want to do the one that someone asked, which was ACP versus uh, Domitor, geriatric patient, cardiac output. That was the general gist of the question. Um, so I just wanted to run through the two drugs really quickly, just so you get a bit more confident using them. So you have your ACP and your DEX, or metatomidine. It's just, these drugs are basically the same. People have a preference on which drug that they use, that's all. Um, and one is more potent than the other. So the Dexmed comes in a 0.5 mg per mil, generally, and it's more potent than the metatomidine. So understanding these drugs is understanding the receptors that they work on. So this one is an alpha-1 antagonist. Anything that's an antagonist blocks. Goes on to receptor, says no. This is an <coughs> alpha-2 agonist. So it goes on to the receptor, and it's happy. This drug, when you give it, you have alpha-1 receptors running along all the smooth muscle. And the smooth muscle is whether you're vasodilated or vasoconstricted. And you have all your alpha-1s here. What we're doing when we give vasopressors to increase blood pressure is we're going to these alpha-1s and we're telling them, bump it up. So they squeeze those blood vessels, blood pressure comes up. So that's your classic septic patient. You need to support that blood pressure. You're hitting a lot of these kind of receptors. What are you doing when you give ACP? It's a naughty one. Comes in and blocks the alpha-1. So you actually cause vasodilation when you give this drug. It's quite a profound vasodilation when you add in iso, propofol, all, your, any, all in any other drug, because they all seem to kind of cause some sort of vasodilation. Um, and it lasts for six hours. And it's very hard to kick it off those receptors. It's very happy on there. So I've seen an overdose of ACP with a mass drop in blood pressure and we're trying to support it with vasopressors. It's actually quite tricky, to be honest. You tend to like be trying to get the blood pressure above like 40 mean and it's like, I'll give you 60. Um, but it's a real, 
But then obviously it has all the good side effects. These effects are generally, I'm not a super fan of the drug as a pre-med, so I'm not gonna like pump it up. They're generally quite tolerated by a systemically healthy patient. It's, that's why we use it and we're not seeing a lot of dramatic effects, but I would say all of us are seeing hypertension all day, every day, hypertension. Some days you can cope with it, some days you can't. And ACP can be quite a big factor in that. We tend not to use it that much. We have a reserve spot for it. Um, stressed French Bulldogs are one of them. Um, recovery is another one. Because you're going to remove the ISO, your blood pressure is going to improve. ACP can be really nice for smoothing out a recovery. It takes 20 minutes IV, so we tend to give it to any kind of reactive patients that we think are going to be extremely anxious about waking up in a kennel environment. We tend to give them ACP 15 minutes before their anesthetic ends and to try and kind of like smooth out the process. Um, and the other one is an, an IM for, an, again, uh, a reactive patient. You have kind of a patient that you're going to give an intramuscular injection to and you're going to do it. It's, it's already not systemically that sick because it's healthy, it's bouncing around, it's kind of potentially sees you as, as a threat and could potentially bite you. So in these patients, when we're giving the IM, we're quite happy to add ACP into it. And that's with the pretense of smoothing out the recovery at the end. So it kind of lasts for six hours. So it lasts a lot of your procedure and it also helps your plane of anesthesia. Um, in geriatric patients, I probably would avoid, unless it was like extremely anxious. And also your geriatric patient is, are they fit, healthy, 12 year old Springer running around super happy? Are they kind of a slower elderly kind of boxer? You know, I don't know why I said boxer and ACP, it's like the two of them, you can't help yourself. Um, but these patients, for example, maybe I wouldn't jump for ACP in them. They're already pretty calm. You don't need the anxiolytic, which is the anti-anxiety effect of the ACP at this, in this case. Dexmed alpha-2 um, agonist. This again has like a bit of a, oh my God, my mushroom's getting crazy. <laughs> this has a pre and a post effect, and that's what we tend to see. The post effect is that it comes, and it's, it's not... Um, it's an alpha-2, but it's not selective. It hits the alpha-1s a little bit. So your post-effect is what you classically see, your vasoconstriction. There is a direct bradycardic effect, but this, uh, primarily I see what we're seeing is a reflex bradycardia. Your blood pressure goes up, your heart rate falls. This phase, the post-presynaptic, or the post-synaptic phase predominates and lasts around 20 minutes. So generally, when we give an alpha-2, we see this increase in heart rate, drop in blood pressure, or drop in heart rate. And what happens with alpha-2 is it actually comes to the presynaptic and blocks noradrenaline. And over, t when the vasoconstrictive post-synaptic period ends after 20 minutes, you've blocked your noradrenaline and now you have vasodilation. So what you end up actually doing overall with this drug is dropping cardiac output a little bit. Um, so you have this, everyone's like, oh, it's vasoconstricted, blood pressure's reading, so good, it's great. And it is, it's, it's useful, but it's important to know that you have this effect and in 20 minutes you'll probably have some sort of vasodilation. Your heart rate will not increase in response to that. Generally it stays a bit low, so you have a heart rate of 40 and your blood pressure's drop back down to 70 mean. It might maintain at 70 mean, you're pretty happy, but in patients that are sick, Geriatric in some cases. Geriatric patients can tolerate low doses of these drugs, I would say pretty well, if it's a systemically healthy, cruciate geriatric patient. Um, but certainly I wouldn't be racing for these drugs if you have systemically unwell patients. I'd really be considering what's going on with them and whether it's even worth using them. Systemically unwell patients tend to be more sedate, more quiet. They tend not to need hefty drugs like our bouncy kind of four-year-olds that are having elective procedures. Um, and then the, there's the cardiovascular effect. So this drug has quite a profound effect on afterload. So it really increases it as well. So if you have any sort of cardiovascular um, disease, it's not that it's completely ruled out, but I would say um, potentially to have an anesthetist just to kind of help you kind of go through the physiology, understand exactly what's happening when you give that drug, how you're going to interfere with that patient, stabilize versus destabilize, because these drugs have quite profound cardiovascular effects. Um, and luckily, most of our patients are systemically well and we can use them quite freely. But this is the kind of effects that you're trying to think about when you're using them and whether those patients would tolerate them. Most of our geriatric patients, we tend to actually just use alpha-2s, very low dose alpha-2. 
um, if they don't have any sort of concurrent disease. Um, I think that was, it was the capnograph. I got a question about ACP and Dexmed. And the other thing was like cat, um, cat protocols, um, which if that person comes to me, I can talk to you just so we can go through it. So you don't feel like the answer, the question wasn't answered, but it's five to nine. So I'm going to stop talking. But equally, um, if you have any questions, just let me know. And thank you all for your time. Mm -hmm.